Amen. Thank you, Dan. And group, I'm going to get through this. So give me a moment. This is indeed Dan Gaynor's last Sunday with us as a covenant. And he has been working with us as we've acknowledged and we gave him that party and all that for 17 years and i'm having a hard time uh that piece that you just watched him play was on our new piano uh the red beast as david nichols calls it it was given to us by levin uh salt and light community uh church they got another donation that was a step up and this is a step up from our, ours and it's in immaculate shape so we are fortunate and dan wanted to come in although the rest of the music is recorded today he was determined to come in and play on the new piano so it's good to have him here at the at the church i've been staying away and i'll talk about that later but it's good to have him here one more time. So greetings, everybody. Bienvenidos a todos. We welcome you to Ainsworth United Church of Christ. I don't usually start like this, um, so I apologize, but it's, it's a different day. We have a number of other announcements to lift up. Um, we will have the installation of new elected officers and a council officers and committee members uh, nominations and pastoral relations as well as the the currently serving ones i invite you to be on zoom with us in worship on september 12th so that we can install you properly and it is not it's painless and we will do it all via zoom and i will prompt you with what is needed uh, so please be with us on the 12th I also want to uh, invite you, and you've gotten emails or letters about it, our annual meeting of the Central Pacific Conference of the United Church of Christ is coming up at the end of this month. It is free for all to register. You register as a guest. Uh, we have uh, people who've committed to de being delegates, and then any ordained clergy who have standing in the UCC are also voting members of the annual gathering. Um, so I invite you to register and, and view as much as you're able. Uh, it starts on Friday the 24th and then goes in intermittent things. So it's, it's scheduled for people that have day jobs that hopefully they can participate. Uh, our joint uh, worship service will not be until October 3rd when we're, we'll be joining the rest of the conference churches in worship. So we won't be streaming worship from our church on October 3rd. And that's the only day we'll do a joint service. In addition, as we say goodbye to Dan, um, we have a new accompanist and I wrote up something that you will be reading about in the newsletter and our great editor got a picture of him, Brandon Nelson. So we are excited to welcome him next week. Um, so be looking for the newsletter. Uh, it was emailed out yesterday, but it will be mailed on Monday uh, for those that don't get email. Also choir members or wannabe choir members, we're not pushing to come in person, but we do want to meet with you after worship today. The new people, the wannabes that have never been in choir, we invite you to let me know, all of you in, interested in choir, to put on your name, if you can rename yourself, put choir there. If you are new, we want I will put you in a, a breakout room at 1130 uh, to meet with Marvin and uh, myself as soon as I can get in there. And then the rest of the choir will join us at 1145. So choir members, I need you also to put choir by your name so that I can uh, quickly see. And if you are not able to rename you, yourself, then please put it in the chat so I don't have to think too hard. 
because it gets real busy when I'm making breakout rooms. Okay, so thank you and let us uh, prepare our hearts and mind for worship. I invite, I invite sorry, we, I forgot to introduce Stephanie Holloway Nunn in place of Teresa. So we are grateful that she is the liturgist for the day. Thank you, Stephanie. Yes. <clears throat> we sit on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlama, Clap. Stephanie, you're frozen, um, so I will continue. We live in the Portland metro area. We also want to acknowledge the labor of kidnapped and enslaved Africans and of Chinese workers and Latinx farm workers who have risked so much and received so little they have all helped to build the wealth of this country. Please take a moment to honor the people who continue to resist and survive despite the intentional and ongoing attempts to destroy them. Please join me in the invocation. Creator God, you have loved us passionately into being. We come today seeking your presence and to know we are your beloved. Enter our sanctuary and enter our hearts that we may look into your loving gaze and see ourselves reflected there as you see us. Let our love for you reflect and mirror your perfect love as we gather as your beloved community. Our opening hymn, number 35. Almighty God, when I sur survey in wonder. Oh my 
you, Marvin Lynn and Dan Gaynor. That was beautiful. And now we have, uh, we'll center ourselves for prayer. I invite you to continue to put in the uh, uh, chat box any prayer concerns you have. You can send them to Cecil or myself. Uh, Reverend Cecil will read them, um, but I will first tell you uh, the long list that I have already to pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, you have gathered us once again. And for that, we are grateful that we can remain connected throughout this pandemic and throughout all that that bears down on us. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gifts that you have given us, for the gift of this community of faith. We give you thanks for the gift of the vaccine. We give you thanks for the medical and health care providers that we continue to pray for, for strength and comfort and endurance on their long, long, Hall dealing with COVID and so many other concerns in their work. Gracious God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the love that is shared. We've lifted up in, in love the, the names of so many who need special prayers and we continue to pray. We continue to pray for the people of Haiti, for the people of Afghanistan, for our people and others who are there in Afghanistan. We pray for their safety. We pray for their safe journeys. And gracious God, we lift up the people of Haiti who struggle through so many disasters and so much. We also lift up the people of Louisiana and around the world who are dealing with, with disasters of one type or other. And God, we know that we need to follow your 
your will and your way. We need to help bring healing to our scarred earth. We need to help bring healing to people around the world, including ourselves. Gracious God, we pray that your will and your way take precedent over the powers that be, over all that we, that greed calls us to. And gracious God, we pray that those needing new homes that seek survival and safety, that they find homes wherever they end up. This we ask in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray as, and we lift up the prayer of our Savior saying, Creator God, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive our, those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, folks. I can't see everyone who's around. So um, if you are here, just say hello. I, I don't know whether or not Nicole's, if Keith and Veronica are around, or if Elle is around, or Jania is around. I see their parents are, have, um, Good have morning. screened. I hey. See Hi, Jania. Hi. And Daniel's around, and there is Keith. Uh, he's waving. Great. Hey, Keith. And I think I saw somebody else. Okay. Oh, well, Letitia's I'm... daughter, Elle. Yeah, you saw her. Elle is here. Yeah. Great. Great. So I'm going to ask you to help me with, with this lesson this morning. And it's called, Do the Right Thing. So, but I woke up this morning and I wasn't feeling well. So 
So I thought maybe I was getting a cold. So I got me this sweater I'm going to put on. Maybe that'll make me feel better. And then I found this quilt that I'll wrap around me. Maybe that'll make me feel a little bit better. And what else can I do to make me feel better? Oh, I know you all Gene. know about. Go ahead. He. Hot tea. Hot tea. Very good. Yes. Uh, I'll go get that later. What else? Um, when you have a cold, what might you do? You might take some medicine. So your parents will give you some medicine for your cold. And you know, we are all aware of COVID going around. And what are some things we should do to make sure we help us that can help us stay healthy. What is this that I'm doing? Yeah, I'm cleaning my hands. And what do you do when you are around people? What should you wear? A mask. Right. You wear a mask. And you know, these are all things we know about, but sometimes we do not do. And this morning, you're going to hear a scripture from James. And it says, we must hear what we must do but we also must do it. So, be hearers of the word and be doers of the word and not only listeners. So, in order to make sure we are healthy, we, we know what to do. We know how to use hand sanitizers and wear our masks. And when we are sick, we sometimes might have some hot tea and take some medicine. But, you know, we may know what we ought to do, but we also have to do it. And so this means that whenever we hear what we should do, whether it's something from our parents or our teachers or from or maybe Pastor Lynn, we not only listen, but we must be doers as well. Did so, I what be? And you could drink hot cocoa. Hot what? Cocoa. Oh, hot cocoa. That's my favorite. Yeah. And that makes you feel better. So remember to do all those things. We we always hear them telling us what we ought to do. And sometimes I, we get tired of listening to our parents and the teachers and to the pastor, but we must not only hear them, but we must also do it. So I'm going to put on my mask and let's listen to the rest of the service. Thank you all. Heaven is my goal Each and every day I gotta keep on moving Moving in the right way But if I stumble Just step aside 
because I don't want nobody oh stumbling over me hey uh, heaven is my goal each and every day oh I got to keep on moving moving in the right way but if I stumble I want you to step aside because I don't want nobody stumbling over me listen it's hard sometimes to stay on the Lord's side but oh I promise I let him be my guide my heart is fixed and my mind is made up and I don't want nobody stumbling over me yes heaven is my goal each and every day got to keep on moving moving in the right way and if i stumble just step aside oh because i don't want nobody i said i don't want nobody i can't let nobody i can't let my friends i can't let my mother I can't let my father, I can't let my sister, I can't let my brother, I said something over me, yes, heaven is my goal, each and every day gotta keep on moving moving in the right way and if i stumble just step aside because i don't want nobody i don't want nobody I can't let nobody, I can't let my friends, I can't let my mother, I can't let my father, fool stumbling over me. Amen. Beautiful music, Willie. The scripture today is from the book of James, and much like the song that Willie just sang, the book of James has many um, reminders to the 12 tribes of Israel that um, what it is to live a godly life. Today I am reading from the New International Version of this scripture. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from our creator of the heavenly lights, who does not change like sifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth 
that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, for one's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like one who looks at their face in a mirror and after looking at themselves goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the one that looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what that one has heard, but doing it. That one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers themselves religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God, our creator, accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself. And uh, that last word was to keep oneself unstained by the world. You froze up, Stephanie, but thank you. I'm sorry. No, you got through it all but the very end, so thank you. One thing I forgot to mention at the beginning, and I'm going to give you a little time. I, I pleaded and pled and sent messages out and told you last week we were going to do questions for the journey. I do it once or twice a year. And I invited questions of all kinds of faith, the Bible, the Ainsworth, questions about our church, about our denomination, the United Church of Christ, uh, about spirituality, about the world and, and our faith, you know, anything you can think of. I got only one question sent to me. So if you have any questions that you would like me to tackle during this time, you, you're welcome to send them to me in the chat and I will do my best to attend to them. Uh, otherwise, maybe this is what you want. You'll have a short service, but I will uh, speak longer than the one question it requires. So you're, you're able to control my speaking or not if you don't send questions. Anyway, I did receive a question from Nikki Johnson, who's with us from New Mexico. And I'll read her the, the main portion um, of what she sent. In metaphysics, there is a lot of attention paid to personal psychic growth. That is, people should learn to go deeper beyond their automatic pilot's existence. They might say awareness of the unconscious and mastery of that is where real growth occurs. In some indigenous and Eastern traditions, the desire to grow in this way is coupled with disciplines or sacrifices that catalyze that process. In some native traditions, the sweat lodge, which is a demanding, sometimes painful experience that produces insight and growth is such a mechanism. So she goes on, historically in the Christian faith, fasting and some extreme practices like flagellation, which is whipping yourself, were employed toward that end. In the near term, one, one could say Christians don't do much to push that edge. A common criticism of Christianity is that its adherents are superficial. 
So with all that, uh, Nikki asks, what are my thoughts about the need for Christians to acknowledge that growth is work and actively employ internal and physical practices to enhance spiritual growth? That's a long and very, very thought out, thoughtful question. Um, and it gave, I was glad she sent it early because it gave me lots of time to think. I certainly agree that growing in, in our faith and spirituality is, is work. It's not, it doesn't come by osmosis, it comes by effort. Um, and I, and people, I, we always, when we prepare new members and they go through, there's a commitment question about growing in the Christian faith. We talk about how do you do that? And certainly Bible study and reading and prayer, participation in worship and service and, and other ways that we participate in our community of faith help feed our spirits and our faith. Um, it, it, it's not all easy and it's certainly not um, supposed to be all easy. I, what I don't, what I do want to say is the United Church of Christ and me personally, we don't, I don't judge and we don't judge other religions and say we, we have it all and we know what to do and this is the only way. No, we respect other religions and other rituals. But one thing I struggle with, and um, certainly I would with flagellation, the whipping of oneself, or anything that, that um, hurts the body, damages the body, I struggle with that. And I... Um, and I go back to the scripture from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So it, to, to traumatize one's body, I think, is going too far. It's my opinion. Um, I do know that fasting can help people focus. Uh, so you know that I enjoy silent retreats and, and just getting away from stimulation and, and being silent with myself, which for some people is quite a struggle. That helps me deepen my spirituality and faith. Um, but I also know um, that there are people whose lives have, have brought them through lots of suffering. And I would hate to promote that one would have to physically do something to make their bodies suffer more when the life situations that they encounter are suffering, plenty of suffering. And we know that, that tragedy and trauma um, and, and things, disasters that we encounter, uh, that we live through, those kinds of things can help deepen our faith as we struggle through them. Uh, so I would not put in, or encourage someone to put more pain on their bodies than what life brings. Um, I would encourage people to do what it takes for them to focus on God and to find space in their hearts to pray and open themselves to God to help them deepen their faith. Um, but it may not be a direct answer, Nikki, and I don't even know where you are today. I'm sure you're out there somewhere. There you are. I see you. But, but I tell you, I've known people that have been through so much suffering, they don't need a sweat lodge or, or flagellation or anything to bring themselves closer to God, because without God, they may not have survived all that they've gone through. And, and that's, that's, uh, I remember that God created us, our bodies are a temple and we are bound to, to uh, take care of our bodies. I will end that answer it's going to lead me to something else, but I did see a few questions come in. In fact, 
quite a few. So up, oh, these questions are going to go on and on. Okay, uh, you guys are real prolific today. Um, what important decisions were made at General Synod in the UCC this summer? And I have to confess that's kind of a distant memory after everything that's happened since then. Um, we, I encourage you to look on, on the, the website of the UCC and the news about General Synod. There were several uh, uh, resolutions that were passed. We, uh, there was one in particular that was about creation and care for the earth. I can't remember the details right off the top of my head. There were, there were others that were very important. Uh, one was to, to encourage or work on banning, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, banning therapies that, that try to, uh, um, what is it called? Um, try to, to conversion talk people therapy. out of being gay. What's it called, Cecil? Con conversion therapy. Aversion therapy? Conversion. Un unversion? Con, C-O-N. Oh, conversion therapy, right, thank you. And I was on that committee. I, you'd think I'd remember, but too much has happened since then. Conversion therapy, uh, because there are uh, states that allow conversion uh, therapy to this day, and that's uh, that people go to therapists that are supposed to be able to convert them from being gay, uh, GLBT. Um, there were several others, so I cannot name them, but I will in the future prepare for that, okay? The next one is how do I come up with sermon ideas? Um, that's a good question because I don't know. I think the spirit works a lot of miracles and and often what it is is like I have explained uh, is I'll put down a scripture that I think I'm going to focus on and that might be weeks in advance. And then when the week comes up that I'm supposed to do that scripture and I think, oh my goodness, what am I going to say? But I believe that because I am enwrapped and in, immersed in ministry day in and day out that the ideas come. I also do reading and some research, but, but a, lot of it, a lot of it comes from what's happening in the world and in our congregation and in my life. Um, in addition, we get some very good commentaries. We get the sermon seeds from the United Church of Christ every week. And it, that the person that writes those it bases it on one of the scriptures of the lectionary. It doesn't always, it's not always the, the sermon, the, the scripture I have chosen. So sometimes it's not so helpful. But the days that it is, it is very helpful. And another way I'll confess, although I haven't been there for a while, is I try to attend Bible study from time to time. And the Bible study group at our church gives us gives me lots to, to think about and ponder uh, and, and ideas to preach on. So I try to grab my ideas from what's going on around me and, and around you as I learn about what's happening in your lives. Um, so that's quick answer to your question. What numbered plague is our pandemic? That's Hector's question, of course. And we counted a bunch of plagues. I would guess this is probably, I'm not counting them individually, but we've talked about plagues. Um, plagues, the pandemic of COVID, the pandemic of racism, the pandemic of whatever else we, I, uh, houselessness, the, there are so many. Um, and I don't know if he seriously wants a number, do you, Hector? Because I think we're over the top with the pandemic of COVID and this is like the third wave and there doesn't look to be any end to that. And I will get to that more a little later if there's time. The next question, Marvin Lynn asks, how are we to think about the state of the world today? I can't tell you what to think about the state of the world today. I do know that it can be very, very 
frustrating to say the least. It can be uh, very difficult to, to even think about. I, I believe that the, the state of the world is, we're in a big mess in many ways across the world with uh, the degradation of our environment and climate change and super storms and super reactions to, to what we've done to the earth. That's on my mind all the time. And, and so the state of creation is, is very critical. Um, it's at a critical, I would say, ICU state. Um, as far as the world of people, there are, you know, you ask, if we look at what's going on in Afghanistan and we pray and reach out in whatever way we can and, and hope that people find some hope there. It's, a, it's horrible. It's a tragedy. It's a mess. We look at Haiti and to the suffering there is just inconceivable. And we look at our own divisions in our country. The, we're not suffering like people of Afghanistan or Haiti, uh, but we are in, in, in the divisions that we have and the destruction that's happening and, and in the pandemic and the ways that people are not taking it seriously. So all of that is, is really down, a downer. But I also want to remind you all to look in at the world in smaller places. Look at the world around you. Look at things that you can celebrate and, and lift up. Look at things that give you hope. Um, because there are a lot, there's a lot of good going on in the world. There's a lot of people that work hard. There's a lot of, of love that is shared. And, there is a lot of nature that is thriving in different places. But, uh, and I look at you all, and if you are able to share, to look at the screen and go through three pages is what I have today. Um, you all help us see the world differently than if we just read the newspaper. You all give us a whole view of what love is about and that the world, there is hope in the world. So, so we have to look at the world as people of faith, knowing that God is with us, God calls us to, to act and to do, but also God reminds us that we are loved and not abandoned. And that at, together as a community of faith, we, we can survive and thrive in the love that we share with one another. So probably not a clean answer, but that's what I got. Okay, the next one. What does it mean that God is three and in one? Well, we believe, the United Church of Christ believes that God is, is um, that there is the Trinity. Uh, what we believe about those specifics varies from individual to individual. You don't all have to believe the same. But, but when we say three in one, we believe that God is, is all, all, God is all over the place. And that Jesus isn't, uh, was a reflection or um, a way to share God's reality, what God was about by being born as a human in the world, living in the world, teaching and preaching in the world, healing and doing ministry and learning in the world because Jesus had to learn too. So he was a, he was a way that we can learn about God, that we can see God, that he reflects God. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't all divine, I don't believe. But he was a reflection of God in the world and sent by God. And then the third three in one is the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but that for me is so real. And it's God's presence in the world with us. 
we believe in God, the creator, and, and the kind of the underlying power that has given life to our universe and beyond. But we also know of God that is alive in us and the spirit that dwells in each and every one of us and then is shared among us. So that is a reflection of who God is, just as Jesus is a reflection and the spirit, Jesus promised to send the spirit. Um, it, it, it's the three in one, the threefold of what God is about. It's a way to understand God. And for some people, it's hard to understand God. So Jesus helps them in a very real concrete way we can read about and hear about. And, and preach about and know that Jesus lives through that Holy Spirit. And that's another way we can feel and know and, and, and uh, sense that God is here. So that's to me what three in one means. And it's a way that it's, it's different ways to learn and feel the presence of God. And Kathy is asking, um, do you think that there's anything I can do to help me not allow this added sadness to come within me? She's struggling uh, with a lack of faith in God and herself. Um, that is a hard question, Kathy, and, and a lot of us go through that from time to time. Um, and prayer helps sometimes. Uh, reading the Bible and Bible study can help sometimes. There are other books that help lift us and feed our souls. And sometimes uh, we have to, to have help from a spiritual director or a therapist. Uh, there are many ways to seek help. And being part of a community of faith as and giving in that community as well as receiving help us too. If there's ways we can serve or we can help other people, whether they're in our church or outside, I'm not saying just one place or the other, but when we think beyond our own needs and feel what can I do to help others, that often will help feed our spirits and give us strength, um, lift us. Uh, but there's also a uh, depression that's very real and it's a medical and a chemical problem in our bodies and that can be helped with doctors and medicine at times and therapy but when we try to reach out and to share our faith and to receive and to meet people and listen to their stories i tell you there are times when i have been so lifted up when I've heard the stories of others who have taught me deep, deep faith and what that's about, they make my stories minimal. Um, so, so listening to others and, and communing with others is one is another way to help us. The next question somewhere in, uh, I can't always read the names of people who share. So somewhere in the Bible says the poorly schooled person Somewhere in, is the idea that we must mend our relationships with other members of the congregation before we take communion. At least that's what I was taught during my short time as a member of the Brethren Church. What does the UCC say about this? Oh, this must be, I'm guessing, Carol Pinniger. Um, mending our relationships with other members of the congregation before we take communion. That is not something we have talked about. It certainly is something that would be um, recommended. Uh, but for us, communion has always been no barriers, that the table is open to all. And I certainly would encourage people to mend relationships with whomever they have had uh, broken relationships with, if they can, um, and to, to reach out or at least give up uh, resentment and bitterness, give that up to God. But, but I would never say you have to do that before you take communion, because I am not 
the judge of that. Communion is a table that's open to all, no matter who or where they are on life's journey. So if they're not ready to give up uh, certain resentments, then come to the table and maybe that will help you give up and make better the relationships that are weighing down on you. Um, it, uh, the table communion, the bread and the cup help us, remind us that we are loved, remind us about the presence of Jesus through them and of God in our lives. And, and I hope that it, you can find healing in that table and a way to extend that love to others. The next one is how do you deal with scripture that seems contrary to your faith, such as ones that condone a violent incident or state that Jesus is the only way to God? Well, I think that's Nancy. I see Nan, so I think that's Nancy's question. Um, yep. <laughs> Uh, I, what I do um, in scripture, I try not to proof text. I don't proof text. I don't take a little piece of the Bible and, you know, listen to those that quote it and throw it at me to say you should condemn homosexuality, homosexuality or, or whatever that piece is. Um, and condoning a violent act. For example, if we did proof texting and we took the Bible literally, we probably wouldn't be here and certainly our kids would not because in the old testament there are scriptures that say stone your children if they dishonor the mother and father and i you know or something to that effect i haven't read it recently but but if we took that seriously i think i'd be gone by now i would have been gone long ago and probably all of us at one time or other um so no i i can't take those and with a lot of seriousness in that I have to remember that the Bible was written by humans, inspired by God, but it was their way of understanding how God was working in their lives. And in their each context that it was written and their various contexts over centuries that it was written, there are, are different ways that that is meant to live out. Um, the bottom line and and so the bottom line for some things if if i have no answer directly for somebody that's proof texting and say well what do you say about this is i i throw back what did jesus say about it for example homosexuality jesus did not say anything about it jesus did not condemn homosexuals folks who are homosexual bisexual transgender jesus did not condemn that them um, and Jesus taught, said that the, the, the laws that we are to hold first is to love God with our whole hearts and minds and souls and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, to do unto others as we would do unto ourselves, so forth. So love is the basic underlying message. And uh, as far as, and so that kind of puts into perspective some of the other scriptures. The final part of the question was Jesus, what do I do with Jesus is the only way to God? That, that scripture and that gospel was written for a specific Christian community. It was a lesson for them. And I say to all of you, if you are Christian and you profess to be Christian, Jesus is the only way to be Christian. We need to follow Jesus. We need to follow uh, his teachings and, and, and so forth. He is the bottom line for our faith, so to speak. I hate, shouldn't use that term, but you know what I'm saying. He's the foundation. If, if we are not Christian, I wouldn't say that. If, if there's somebody in another faith, they can be faithful to God and follow their faith. They don't have to go through Jesus to do that. They can learn and, and grow in God's love another way. So I'm not saying Christianity is the only way, but if you're a Christian, Jesus has to be the way we go through our faith. And manifestation. Yes, Jesus manifests Christianity. Carolyn, I got a lot of... Uh, 
I think, accidental typing uh, from you. So I don't know, Carolyn Hinton, if you want to ask me something out loud, you can mute, unmute yourself because I can't read what's there. Um, now, that's all the questions I guess I have. And thank you for coming through at the end. I did want to say, and I, I reflected, I, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but but the, the part from the beginning, the first question that Nikki gave me that leads me to talk a little bit about the COVID response, and I was grateful for Reverend Cecil to talk to kids about that. Um, oops, somebody said I didn't answer Dave Sutton's question. I did not see Dave Sutton's question. Oops, there you are, sorry. Oh, you all weren't supposed to be able to send them to everybody because I try to protect Janine from being bombarded. So anyway, Dave said, how do I know if I'm going to heaven or not? If I'm, what will heaven be like? Well, Lily, uh, Willie's song talks so much about heaven and I appreciated that be beautiful music, Willie. Thank you. Um, I, friends, I cannot believe that God will shut us out. So whatever happens after death, and death is only a part of life, and whatever happens in the next phase of our lives is something that I have faith is good, that God does not shut us out, and that Dave, you too are not shut out. You will be welcomed by God and loved by God. I, I don't know what it is and what it's like, but I know it is good. I think that hell um, is, is something that uh, I don't preach about and talk about much, but but we certainly can create hell for ourselves. And I think if we put up barriers and, and try to push God away and live against God, that must be some kind of hell uh, that we put ourselves through. But God is always there waiting to embrace us, willing us, welcoming us, loving us. And so the hell we create is just what we create, the layers of, of whatever it is that um, almost like bubble wrap, but ugly, um, that we might put up. I think God go, gets through that. And when we die, God will be uh, welcoming us, whoever we are. So hopefully that puts your mind at ease. I don't know. Um, Let's see. So what I was going to say about uh, our bodies as temple and, and leading to that was I wanted to assure you all about our COVID response. Um, we at Ainsworth are taking very seriously, as you know, and you've known this because I've shared this throughout the time since the pandemic started. We've been cautious. Some people think maybe too cautious. Some people think maybe not cautious enough. We are in the process of confirming a, a written protocol procedure policy for COVID, but we've already been acting it for the whole time. We're following what the science tells us, what the CDC and the state and the county health uh, concerns tell us, and we go further if we don't think they go far enough. So we have been very fortunate, friends, that we have not been the cause of an outbreak here at the church. The few times we had some scares were, were not coming from the church and did not spread in the church. And for that, I am so grateful. Um, we, it's still there. And even if you have a vaccine, you can test positive for COVID and even get a bit sick. Thank God. I believe that all of us are vaccinated who can be vaccinated. Uh, and we will continue to push and promote vaccinations. Uh, and when children are able, we are hoping that will happen. Um, 
so we will um, continue with, with that in mind. As the Nicole Marshall on the council said, when we look back um, months and year ahead, we, we don't want to say we weren't careful enough. It's okay if we have to say we were too careful. Who's going to complain about that? So we are being careful. We and uh, we welcome you uh, to continue on Zoom with us if if and when we can come back to, together uh, outside. We will we will determine that. If you have to come to the church, count on wearing a mask. Don't come when others are here if you can help it. There's only a few of you that have to. There are ways uh, that you can interact and drop off things and so forth. Um, but call ahead, uh, let us know. Um, and we can meet outside. And I, once I'm done quarantining, I will go back to meeting with people and, and masking and, and inside too, if somebody requires that. Um, I am not pos uh, COVID positive. I'm just quarantining for safety because Hector might, in case he contaminated me. But, uh, um, but we will continue to be careful. And that God has given us uh, intellect and help and miracles of medicine. That vaccine to me is a miracle. And so we need to use those miracles and not deny them. So I continue to encourage you and lift you up as preachers of the word of vaccines, because I know a lot of you are working hard to get your loved ones and others uh, to agree to be vaccinated. Continue that work because that's the only way this is gonna end. Um, and also when boosters are out and um, please uh, get, get boosted. Um, that is uh, what Hector is in need of as soon as he's able, um, and that we all will. So thank you, friends. Thank you so much. Um, I will announce now before, hold on. Oh, well, I'll wait. I shall not fear the arrow by day, nor shall I fear the terror by night. The God who governs angel armies has set encampments around me whom shall I fear I shall not fear the arrow by day nor shall I fear the terror by night the God
That was beautiful, Marvin and Dan. We enjoy uh, music so much in our services. I give thanks for that. And we all give thanks that um, to God and to each other um, that we financially support the work of our congregation. Your offerings are still needed. So you can arrange your giving in many ways, bringing it to the church, um, sending it in the mail, making an automatic payment from your bank, um, as through bill pay or something like that. But we appreciate your giving and we appreciate God that God meets our needs. That was a very wonderful surprise. Thank you, B and Dan. And um, it was wonderful to hear B's voice singing. And 
Dan, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oops, go ahead, Stephanie. <laughs> Please join me in the prayer of dedication. To you, O oh God, we give these gifts. In the giving, may we be transformed, and through our gifts, may we help transform our world. In the name of Jesus, we lift these thanks to, and giving to you. Amen. Thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Dan and Beatrice. And, and this, friends, is the time we will give a standing ovation to Dan because that's it. Um, he's done. So let's give him, you can unmute and give him a standing ovation or yell or scream or just. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Miss your playing, but we're going to see you, I'm sure. Dan, I don't Come know. Come back, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dan, Dan, you have gifted hands. And thank you. Dan, Dan. Woo! Does anyone see? He is there. He's hidden, but he's there. Um, we are so grateful for all that he has done throughout the years and will do in the future as a doctor and as uh, a friend of our congregation or part of our congregation. Thank you. And so, friends, Oh, I do. Oh, there they are. Now we can see them. He's Ainsworth streaming. So thank you again. They're being behaving. Oops, Beatrice, put that mask up. <laughs> They're behaving. Um, friends, we will not have a new wannabe choir people uh, meeting. So the choir will meet as soon as we get you in a room. So put your name put choir by your name or I'll, I'll probably remember most of you, but just in case to make my life easier, put choir by your name. We're not expecting you to be in person, but we do wanna meet with you and touch base. So now, be, now we go out into the world or stay by our screens, know that God has created you and has given you the gift of you. You are a gift to yourself and to the world. Go use that gift in the best ways you can to reflect God's love. Go filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and walk in the steps of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>